What's up everyone, Prague here, and I literally just finished Children of Dune, so as I did with Dune Messiah and Dune 1, I'm going to just jump in and talk about what I thought. A small difference for this one is that I actually wrote down notes, uh, so I'm what I talk about is going to be kind of in chronological order, and I think it's going to be a lot more specific, uh, whereas in the other videos I was just sort of talking about big ideas. Um, but the first thing I want to talk about is is sort of just a big idea, and it's something I realized. Well, I, I sort of realized it as I was reading uh, Dune Messiah, but it's something that Frank Herbert does as a writer, um, at least in Dune. I don't know about his other books. Is he reveals like all of the plots and the like strategies of the villains in a very early chapter and like very explicitly. So in Dune one. One of the very, I think it's the second chapter actually, uh, is the Baron Harkonnen explaining to Fed Rautha everything he's going to do. And, and, and basically all the possible plot twists are just thrown out there. And I don't think that's a bad thing. I, I just think it's a very interesting way of writing the story. So it's like the, you as the reader know a lot more than uh, the characters in the story. Um, it's sort of a different way of sort of implementing those plot twists. Um, and yeah, it's the same thing in Dune Messiah, I believe, third, or first chapter, Bronto of X, uh, reveals, like, all the super specific, like, oh, this, this conspiracy is going to happen, this conspiracy is going to happen, and then I think in the third, third chapter, that's the sort of, uh, assembly between Mahaya, Mirilan, Saitale, and Edric, where, you know, I mean, that goes even more into depth of uh, all the conspiracies that are going to happen. And then in Children of Dune, you get the Levenbreck is in a very early chapter revealing that he is training these tigers uh, to put a Carino on the throne. And for his own selfish uh, goals that do not come to fruition at all as he dies very soon. And then in the chapter where it's revealed that he dies, or I think he does die in that chapter, uh, you get this, like... Strategi strategizing between Tekanic and uh, Wenzakia, I think her name is. I, I mean, I, I know her name is just like Wenzakia or something. I don't know how you say it, though. But, uh, yeah, so all three books, very early in the, in the plot, the schemes of the villains are revealed, which is pretty interesting. So now I'm just going to go sort of through my notes in chronological order. I picked out a quote here on page 34. I think this is Leto. He says, I don't like the things I know I'll do. For the first time in my life, I understand my father. Now, reading this, if you've watched my other reread videos, I'm reading a lot with the intention of investigating Paul as a twisted character or a morally ambiguous character. Um, and with that, you know, with analyzing Paul as a character, you have to think about, like, the whole dying of prescience thing and and how he came to the the futures that he desired morally you know how he how he justified what he did and i mean here you get a pretty explicit admission you know he he didn't like the things he was going to do so you can say that's the jihad we'll get into more later of what exactly paul did with the future we got a lot of information in this book i didn't uh, I didn't expect how much my sort of headcanon would be supported by this book, but we'll get into it. Uh, next, I put a little note here that Jessica is a villain a lot in, in certain parts of this book. I think Leto is, is the protagonist for most of this, but at the end it sort of gets sketchier. And But for that reason, the, the reason that he is... The protagonist and Jessica is willing to kill him at some points and puts him through this uh, forced spice trance and she goes back to doing some of this some of the work for the sisterhood um, yeah she's sort of a villain in this book now I also put here page 56 Alia is talking about like um, who would understand the help she required not her mother who could never quite 
drive away the specter of any gesture of judgment, just more, you know, making you pity Alia more, and really showing, like, Jessica's, she's a, at least a very flawed character, if not a villain. Uh, later, we get some very funny quotes during Alia's sort of existential crisis where all these inner memories are, are warring. We get multiple times in this book, but here's the first admission that Agamemnon is an ancestor of the Atreides. Uh, the exact quote is, I, Agamemnon, your ancestor, demand audience. And I was thinking, why, why Agamemnon? And so I did a little bit of research, found that Agamemnon, uh, his house was called Atreus, which is very similar to Atreides. Um, I don't know if that's the only reason, but another reason possibly is if you think about the Iliad, where Agamemnon steals this guy's daughter as a war prize, that kind of resembles Agamemnon trying to steal Alia as a war prize, so to speak. So, like, he wins the war against the internal memories and steals Alia as a war prize. Ganema also mentions Agamemnon, so he could also have tried to steal Ganema as a war prize. Um, just my my two cents on the whole Agamemnon thing. Also mentioned in the inner memory battle is Ovid, a Roman poet, and John Bartlett, an American writer, which this would have gone completely over my head if I didn't research. The exact quote is, an insane cackle in her head, talking about Alia, asked, whatever has become of Ovid? Simple, he's John Bartlett's Abid, which sounds like nonsense, but uh, if you don't know what Abid means, I didn't know what it means. It means in the same source, I guess it's sort of a footnote abbreviation. And upon researching Ovid and John Bartlett, I find that they are actually in the same source, because John Bartlett, uh, his, I think, most well-known work is a book of quotations called Bartlett's Familiar Quotations. And what do you know, he writes down some, translates some Ovid quotes, uh, and some of them are pretty interesting. I think the one that Herbert wanted us to find is, uh, they come to see, they come that they themselves may be seen. <laughs> it's, a diff it's almost a tongue twister, but yeah, I mean, that, that makes a lot of sense considering what's going on in Alia's mind. So whoever this insane cackling voice uh, belongs to, it's sort of hinting at what's going on in Alia's head right now. They come to see, they come that they themselves may be seen. So all these voices are trying to be seen. And then another quotation that I found interesting between Bartlett and Ovid was added in a 1980 version of Bartlett's Familiar Quotations because it's being continuously updated, I guess, uh, post-mortem. Now, asterisk on this one, because it's 1980 and Children of Dune came out in 1976, but I found it interesting nonetheless. It reads, Nor can one easily find among many thousands a single man who considers virtue its own reward. The very glory of a good deed, if it lacks reward, affects them not. Unrewarded uprightness brings them regret. Nothing but profit is prized. That sort of makes a lot of sense with what's going on in, with Alia, too, right? And so maybe this was a bit of prescience from Frank Herbert himself um, to reference this quote from the future. And the next, next notes I have here are actually, I was very happy when I read this because I thought it supported my theory about Paul not knowing the good things that his actions would bring, not really... Not, knowing the golden path or understanding it fully, as Leto does. Paul's interpretation of the golden path is referred to multiple times. I have page 72 cited here, so that's around what, the time where it, where it appears first, as his last vision. And that supports my theory a lot, that, that Paul didn't know about the golden path. And okay, we'll get we'll get more to this later because you have some bigger conversations between Leto and uh, and Paul. Uh, I also have a quote here: "How desperate the need to unmake past mistakes." That is uh, Leto recalling Paul, so basically admitting that Paul maybe made a mistake here, and 
that's sort of the realization he comes to in Messiah, right? This extreme guilt that he has. He has even more guilt in this book, which we'll get to more. Um, and I wrote a little note here, Leto is the hero of Dune. And this is me for the first three books, right? I don't know what he does in God Emperor or what happens later on. I mean, I know a little bit, but just through the first three books, Paul's not the hero of Dune. Leto is the hero of Dune. Um, that's what I've written here. I'm not sure I entirely agree with that anymore. Uh, they're all very complex characters. As I said in my Dune Messiah reread, nobody is really good in this story, I think. And everyone's super complex and morally gray, so... Yeah. Anyway... I also wrote here that the chapter with Leto and Ganema when they play their sort of parrot game is really good. Um, it might just be because I was rereading, but seeing the explicit mentions of like, we've had enough Atreides gods and we need to fix mistakes and, and so on is really uh, satisfying as a close reader. And I mean, I just like the way this this is kind of similar to my favorite chapter in Book of the New Sun by Gene Wolfe, uh, which is called Mirrors, and something similar to what happens to Ganema and Leto, where they're switching personalities, losing themselves uh, to their inner memories. Something similar to that happens in, in Mirrors. And I just find that really fascinating. And I, I did read, I did try to read for possible theory that Ganema in this chapter actually does lose out to Chani. But it, it's pretty much written off later when, when Ganima is thinking to herself. Um, but it was an interesting thought. Now, I've written here on page 99, talking about Leto's prolonged life. My father suspected it. He stood at the edge of realization, but fell back. Now it's up to Gani and me. So here you go. Here's more on Paul's understanding of the Golden Path. Now, I said in, in the Dune Messiah video that I don't think Paul even knew about the Golden Path when he did what he did in Dune 1. Regardless of that, let's say he did, you know, here's Leto saying that his father only suspected that he could be given this eternal life or whatever and become God Emperor. Um, kind of plays more into my theory. Like, even if Paul did know about the Golden Path, he didn't fully understand it. He didn't know if it was going to pay off or whatever, right? All he knows is terrible purpose, terrible purpose, and later golden path. Uh, I put, I guess I'll, I'll find this. I just put page 102, the Apocrypha of Muad'Dib. I think this was something else that I thought supported my theory about uh, evil Paul. So I have the book here. This is the quote at the at the beginning of the chapter. Atrocity is recognized as such by victim and perpetrator alike. By all who learn about it at whatever remove, atrocity has no excuses, no mitigating argument. Atrocity never balances or rectifies the past. Atrocity merely arms the future for more atrocity. It is self-perpetuating upon itself a barbarous form of incest. Whoever commits atrocity also commits those future atrocities thus bred. So here is Paul basically admitting to... Yeah, committing atrocity and, and, and claiming responsibility for the atrocities afterward. Um, so, whether or not you agree, if you still think that Paul is like this hero, savior, or whatever, Paul disagrees with you. The preacher disagrees with you. Um, and this is, again, I mean, a lot of this... A lot of this comes down to how much Paul understands about the Golden Path, how much he understands about his terrible purpose. Um, yeah, I mean, we'll see in God Emperor. I think I really do have to read God Emperor. My vibe from this book, I mean, we'll get we'll get to it, right? But as the preacher starts to talk more about what he believes uh, later in Children of Dune. Good point. Uh, Faradin really impressed me in this book, became easily one of my favorite characters because he's got such an intriguing arc, and soon after Wenzikia, like, it's sort of revealed, like, Wenzikia was sort of fodder, she gets, uh, banished. It's kind of funny, like, Faradin just banishes her, and then later he just shrugs. Faradin's kind of a beast in a lot of parts of this book, um... 
But anyway, what I actually wrote here is there's a lot of what does Faradin want? He's finding out what he wants, if, if he really wants to be Emperor, if he wants to be Bene Gesserit, if he wants to agree with what his mother uh, plotted and, and Tiakanic plotted. And it reminds me a lot of Jon Snow in A Song of Ice and Fire, right? This sort of idea of, you know, what, what does this character want? They're obviously in sort of this protagonist position, but they don't know what they want, and they're sort of spending the story careening their way around, finding where where they want to go, which is a dynamic that I really like. Next note, I put Sheba. This is, I think, referring to something Ganema says when she is conditioning herself to believe that Leto is dead. She says, I know how I can do this by the this person named Sheba, who is this ancient person that nobody remembers. And looking it up, I got no individual person, but Sheba is an ancient civilization, the name of an ancient civilization, that had a succession of female queens, which is sort of similar to the you know, female lineage that the Reverend Mothers understand. And so I thought, you know, my theory, I guess, is that Gani is able to lie about Leto being dead because of her other memory. That's some sort of, like, exploit <laughs> of uh, truth sensing. And then there's also another random... Uh, that's something that I really realized reading this book, because there are a lot, of, a lot of random references to modern history. Uh, so yet another one, a reference to Shena Cherub, and this is when uh, Ghani assassinates Palim Basha, I think his name is, something like that. And that's when I researched and I could find I could find no like connection to it. I mean, it, it's obviously a thing. It's like Sennacherib was a kingdom, I think, but there was no reference to like using a poison dart or something. So this is just Frank Herbert being super cryptic in a sort of Wolfian kind of way. And speaking of Wolf, I came here to make a comparison between Baron the Baron and Alia and Thecla and Severian. It's not as exact because Thecla and Severian in the Book of the New Sun sort of become one person. Their personalities sort of meld. But the Baron and Alia don't really meld. I think there's always a sort of internal dialogue between them. But we do see Alia getting, like... It's very strange. Alia gets, like, pediophilic te tendencies. Um, and she gets much more rash, I guess, and evil without it being explicitly the Baron. You know, I think it's sort of the Baron seeping into her personality. Um, but there is sort of a dialogue going on there, so it's not it's not the best comparison. That being said, I do think it's beneficial to read through the Alia chapters, thinking about her not as just Alia, but as Baron Alia. Um, and it maybe provides more in insight into her plots and how she acts. Uh, next, I put here, uh, there's a part where Leto randomly starts talking about the Canterbury Tales, and he says, no one would remember Chaucer except the village on Ganserid, which I I'm assuming you never get anything else on that, but, you know, it's just Herbert being Herbert being cryptic as hell. Uh, here's something that I found very interesting is, so I think this is something that is discussed a little bit in the fandom, and that's, uh, I forget his name, Tagir, something, something Mahandas, the uh, long-haired Balasset player that appears when Jessica is in council with Alia. He, there's a random epithet at the beginning of a chapter, or epigraph, I guess, not epithet, epigraph, that is by Mohandas, and he's describing that he was in the cells once, and he got a tortoise ring from his cellmate. And this is very interesting because it, this epigraph comes out of nowhere, but the ring comes back. And the ring comes back because Namri is wearing a similar ring. And I can think of two reasons for this. It, reason one, this is foreshadowing that Namri is Alia's, you know, tool. Um, and that would be on the assumption that Mohandas was also Alia's tool. And it could be the case that, you know, these guys are friends, and they had this ring as sort of a Fremen custom. 
uh, this tortoise ring sort of representing like sort of a friendship bracelet. Or this could be that Mahandas was going to be sent to the Karinos, which he obviously never was, or at least it was no mention was made of it. And maybe he was killed by Namri, and Namri took this ring or something like that. Um, so this is interesting. I think it's an unsolved mystery. Yeah, tortoise ring. Uh, yep, I put a note here about Faradin banishing his mom and just shrugging it off. Faradin is kind of a beast. Uh, page 26. Um, oh, this is interesting. I put a note here of Leto having a vision of... Let me look at this, because Leto has a vision of something that Ganima says. I was thinking, oh, she has to say this later because it's a vision, right? And I don't think I ever caught her saying this. So let me find the quote. Yeah, here we go. So Leto's having a vision. Ganima's standing in front of him. She says, Gurney knows. He told me they're Duncan's words, and Duncan was speaking as a mentat. In doing good, avoid notoriety. In doing evil, avoid self-awareness. Uh, that had to be future, far future. So maybe this is something that didn't even happen in the course of Children of Dune, but I guess I'll keep it in the back of my head and see if it comes up. And God Emperor. Maybe some of you that are watching this video are laughing at me because I don't understand what was going on there, but whatever. Alright, here we get more Leto Paul stuff. So Leto says, There was no moral grandeur to my father's life, Namri, only a local trap which he built for himself. Again, this is me bringing this up because I don't like the argument that Paul is like a savior or a hero. Leto himself says it. There was no moral grandeur to my father's life. He built a trap for himself. And somebody commented on my Messiah video, I think, that as soon as Paul used the uh, Missionaria Protectiva to save his mother and, and himself when they were in the desert about to be killed by the uh, Fremen troop, he was trapped into the Jihad, into this sort of destiny. And that what Leto's saying here makes a lot of sense for that. Um, and if you consider that, you have to you have to think that maybe the path that Paul chose, the the, the future that he created, was not the best. And here I put Alia and Ganima's plan to kill Faradin. I mean, Ganima, I guess, is faking the plan, or is, this is just her in her like uh, conditioned state. Their plan to kill Faradin is incredibly stupid. <laughs> um, it's sort of interesting because Alia does a lot of stupid stuff. She does some smart stuff, but she also does a lot of stupid stuff in this book. And I think, you know, the Baron is smart. So maybe the stupid stuff is a result of, like, this unstable existence that Alia has. Because I don't I don't want to say that it's the result of the Baron. Because the Baron is, is, is smart, you know, it's his, like, one redeeming quality. Um, but yeah, it's interesting. And I put a note of this because Irulan is sort of shit on despite being right that the plan is stupid. Um, and Irulan deserved better. Uh, 100%. Uh, and furthermore, Irulan, Ganima goes into this sort of dark place uh, with her inner personalities um, and just starts crying. And Irulan consoles her despite Ganima being like a complete dick to her. Um, yeah. Irulan is bae. All I'm gonna say. Uh, page 292. Ah, here's another very interesting thing. On page 292, Leto has a prescient wet dream. Um, that's all I'm gonna comment about that. You can turn to page 292 if you want more information about that. I would not if I were you. Um, yeah, it's very strange. Uh, not sure what Herbert was thinking there, but moving on. Page 349. We got more explicit stuff. Here's, I guess, where I'll talk about Paul and um, Leto and what I think of all that. The quote here is, Your hands have done good and evil. That's Leto. And Paul, or the preacher, says, But the evil was known after. I think Paul is lying here, right? I mean, we have that epigraph that I read earlier. Paul knew a lot of the evil that was going to come about. And through Messiah, Messiah is his breakdown. 
and Children of Dune is his, what's the word I'm looking for? Repentance? It's, it's his attempt to absolve himself by assuming a position among the cast out and trying to destroy the image of Muad'Dib. Um, you also get discussion about the Typhoon struggle and the Jihad. Um, Paul mentions the Typhoon struggle. My, my vibe from this conversation is that Paul, what Paul knew of the Golden Path was that he could become emperor for millions of years or whatever. He didn't really understand how, as Leto commented earlier in the book, but he knew that he could, and he knew something about the Typhoon struggle, and that the Typhoon struggle is sort of an addition to his terrible purpose. Um, but he at least doesn't know that humanity will go extinct if there is no typhoon struggle which is what leto tells him so again i mean you can interpret this how, how you will i think that paul made some very selfish choices in dune one maybe he was entrapped by the missionaria protectiva uh, maybe he had to do it to survive maybe he would have been better than a better emperor than fade rautha better than shaddam and so on um and obviously he knew something about his seed right he knew something about leto being important but obviously he doesn't understand he doesn't understand everything here that's the most important part i'm getting at he doesn't know for sure that instigating the jihad is going to result in something good and this is what leto seems to know um and again <laughs> it's good by leto's morality right and i'm realizing now he speak he talks about the typhoon struggle and so on that this is leto making a decision and we'll see if that's the right decision when i get into god emperor for the first time um I made a note of something earlier in the book, and I thought, oh, I don't think this is foreshadowing, I'm going to take it out, because I haven't heard of anything like this um, in the later books. But after reading this part about the Typhoon struggle and this conversation between Leto and Paul, I decided to add this back in. So I don't have the exact quote, but there is a passage explaining why the great houses don't just bomb each other with nuclear weapons. And the conclusion, I forget who's musing at this part, I think it's Alia or Irulan, or maybe Ganema. Uh, they, they come to the conclusion that nuclear weapons were only meant to be used against some greater intelligence that was going to threaten humankind. And if we're thinking about the Typhoon struggle and humanity will go extinct if no Typhoon struggle, that might be foreshadowing. That's my interpretation of it. Um, if you're watching this and if you read the whole series, maybe you're laughing at me, but I thought, you know, I'm bringing those events together, the conversation between Paul and Leta about the Typhoon struggle and this foreshadowing about nuclear weapons being used to save humanity, right? Because they they both have the similar theme of protecting humanity from getting obliterated. All right, just three more notes here. I put a note here about Stilgar's arc. I don't really know if Ark is the right word, but just Stilgar is a character. Stilgar is awesome in this book. Um, he's very conflicted. He has to kill Duncan Idaho. He has to do, you know, I, I love this. Well, here's my, my second quote, so I guess we only have one more. Um, the camaraderie between Stilgar and Tikanic is, is awesome. It's very funny. Look, I would, if, if Leto came out here, I, I talked about this similar dynamic in Messiah with my agreement with Bronzo of Ix. I agree with Stilgar and Tiganic. Like, what the heck? This, I mean, this guy is coming out of nowhere. He's just telling everyone to trust him. Talking about stuff that's going to happen 4,000 years in the future. Yeah, it would be super sketchy, but still, Stilgar is, Stilgar is you know, he has his honor and he's going to serve uh, Maudib and, and his, um, his kin, so Stilgar is awesome. And Tiakanic, there's not much about him in this story, uh, but he's he's a lot like the Fenrings. I've been thinking about the Fenrings a lot and how awesome they are because they just kind of go off and do their own thing. Uh, you know, Hasmir is like, nah, I'm not gonna kill Fall, and they have that sort of bond of like, hey, we were both sort of like unjustly groomed to be the Quizas Haderach. Um, 
yeah, but I wish the Fen Rings were more fleshed out, and it's sort of the same with Tekanic. I wish he was more fleshed out. And then my last note here is just a note on the camaraderie between Gurney and Asmar Tuik. I love that there is a little callback um, where Gurney remembers Tuik, and Tuik was, you know, he was a pretty pretty dope character in, in Dune, so. Oh. I spoke a lot here, and I spoke with very little breaks. So maybe I should, I don't know if, if the notes are a better, a better way to do these videos. And I don't know if I'm going to do a video on, you know, the Dune 4, 5, and 6 of the Dune Chronicles. Because, you know, it's not a reread for me. So I, I, I sort of want to just read, maybe I'll just do like, a, you know, thoughts after reading instead of thoughts after rereading. Um, I think, I think I'm going to hold off. On continuing the series for now. I did like Children of Dune a lot more uh, this time reading it. I'd still say it's below Dune and Dune Messiah, but I understand why people really like this book. It's got a lot of suspenseful moments. Um, there are more moments where you actually don't know what's going to happen. Um, but yeah, I think it's just going to come just behind Dune and Dune Messiah. Dune Messiah is still my favorite. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm going to put off 4, 5, and 6, I think, because I'm going to try to read the Pullman novels in anticipation of the His Dark Materials show that's going to come out soon. Um, those shouldn't take long. I think they're pretty short. I might make videos on them. Maybe not. And then I've got 4, 5, 6 of the Dune Chronicles. I've got a Wizard of Earthsea. I've got Lord of the Rings. Rereading that. And I've got Hyperion. By Dan Simmons that I want to read. I also want to reread Book of the New Sun because that series is one that needs to be reread. So we'll see. We'll see where it goes from here. But uh, that for now is the trilogy of reread videos. I hope you enjoyed. Hope this video wasn't too long. Let's see. Yeah, 34 minutes. Okay, this video was hella long. But I'll probably cut some of it. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you in the next one.